Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's get started. Welcome to the last colloquium of uh, 2016. Today we have with us uh, Craig DeForest. Craig comes from, to us from uh, the Southwest Research Institute, just um, well here in Boulder, um, where he's been for the last 16 years. I was going to uh, ask Craig for a bio so that I could properly introduce him to you. As it turns out, um, that's not necessary. In fact, I don't even need to introduce him because everything you'd ever want to know about Craig is available on Wikipedia. So. <laughs> Craig today will tell us about um, imaging the uh, the top of the solar corona. Craig, have at it. Thank you. Uh, terrific. So, um, yeah, you, your Wikipedia is something anyone can edit, including you. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope this goes well. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm going to talk about imaging the top of the solar corona. There's actually a lot of topics. As you know, I tend to cram my talks full of a lot of stuff. I worked very hard to remove all equations, so we're going to have a lot of images and a lot of hand waving. And if you want the equations, they're in the cited papers in the appropriate slide, which, because this is being recorded, you can go back and find. So uh, here's the roadmap. Uh, we're going to set the stage with a review of, of imaging the corona and heliosphere, which most of you folks have uh, have done a little bit of, I think. Uh, why is the slow solar wind variable? Uh, what is the edge of the corona? Why do we care about it? Uh, then we'll get down to business and talk about uh, actual recent work we've done on imaging the top of the corona and the edge of what we would call the heliosphere, the, the beginning of proper solar wind. Uh, and then uh, in the wrap-up, we'll talk about what does it all mean, what's next, and I'll give you a little summary. So that's sort of the, your standard microcentury talk. Uh, moving on, here's the, the mid-corona invisible light seen with stereo core 2. Um, the, the instruments that are operated by HAO go a little bit lower, and I'm sorry I didn't get a movie in time, uh, Joan. Uh, but you can see uh, we're looking at Thompson scattered light here. It's been background subtracted, uh, so uh, there's some little errors in that. That's why there are ring artifacts here. Uh, but you're seeing, aside from that's a star that didn't get subtracted right, you're seeing uh, dense material scattering sunlight uh, via Thompson scattering. Uh, we've got a radial magnetic field that's producing this striation that's just characteristic of the corona. Uh, it's so familiar that even you know my five-year-old used to draw the corona when, when he drew the sun. Uh, supersonic flow going out. We're, we're all familiar with, uh, with the, the solar wind being supersonic. Uh, and the flow can shape the magnetic field. Even though beta is less than one, that's because there's more ram pressure than there is thermal pressure in the plasma. So it, it steers the magnetic field outward. Um, OK, so again, this is all just fourth grade stuff for this audience. Uh, somewhere out around here, the point of Lasco C3 was to try and see this transition from the corona to the solar wind. So it went out to 30 solar radii. And you can see all kinds of things. There are hundreds of papers on this, which I can't even begin to address here. Um, but the material is still dragging magnetic field lines out into the solar system. We've got radial flow between 300 and 800 kilometers a second. We've got CMEs going off like crazy, star field in the background. Something that's interesting that's happening here is we know that the high, the, the high magnetic field strength has to drop as you go out. And the reason is that both the magnetic field and the density are dropping as 1 over r squared. So the magnetic pressure has to drop like r to the minus 4. OK, so beta is rising throughout this range. And some, at some point, it'll exceed unity. Uh, and of course, we see betas near unity and, and well above unity in, in the in-situ data. Moving out still further, uh, stereo high 1 is, is really what hit the mark and imaged the transition. And I'm going to be talking about this particular transition and its consequences for most of the rest of the hour. Um, down in here, inside the Lasco C3 field of view, we see sort of maybe it's a little lumpy, but it's still characteristically coronal plasma. We see these striations coming out from the sun. There's lots of density variation uh, emerging from the sun. Out here on the left-hand side, aside from the, the planet here, I think that's Venus, uh, we see a much more sort of puffy structure. And uh, the core of the talk, when we get to it, will be about really diving into that puffy structure and what it means. Uh, so, oh, yeah. Can you get the lights down in the back? Uh, sure. It's always hard to, to view the movies properly with the lights all the way up. 
Thank you. All right. You really need the lights out for this one. This is um, something that's just five years old, is that we can view the solar wind in Thompson scattering really quite far from the sun. So um, these are degrees from the sun, and we can see the solar wind out to about 90 degrees from the sun. These are real Thompson scattering features after subtracting the stars and the, the background. And you can, looking at this movie and comparing it to the best that comes out of, say, uh, KCOR, uh, you might think this is pretty craptacular. But um, the wonder is that it's there at all. Whoops, I jumped ahead here. So um, this signal is less than a thousandth of the average radiance coming into the instrument. So um, we've really had to work hard to get down to it. Um, but now it's sort of old hat. We know how to do it, and we can, we can repeat it. Uh, moving forward, I know this movie will be new to all of you. Uh, I, in fact, it won't, because I presented it here a while ago. Uh, <laughs> I bring it up again now uh, just to highlight this is an integrated view of from the surface of the sun here. Uh, this is the corona in EUV. This is the corona in Thompson scattered light. And then these are uh, the solar wind imaged in Thompson scattered light. Um, I want to highlight to you that although the detection process is the same between the orange and the gray stuff, the character of the material is very different. Right? Just the texture, just, just the first impression you get is really quite different. And you know why is that? Uh, why should the solar wind look so different from the corona. Um, if we zoom in a little bit, uh, here's a, whoops, whoa, I'm getting ahead of myself here. There we go. This should start playing. I don't know why it's not playing. Uh, let's do this again. Here we go. Are you going to go? Well, it's not going to work. Um, what you're supposed to see here is, is just a zoom in of coronal blobs and things coming out here, the Sheely blobs and other things coming outward. And over here, you can see that many of them seem to break up when they get out into the high one field of view. So there are a lot of really interesting transitions that happen right around here between 15 and say 50 solar radii. And unfortunately, it's very hard to compare between what the corona looks like and what this region looks like. Because although this, this high one has very high resolution in the vertical direction on these frames, uh, it's smeared by motion blurring in the horizontal direction. So your eye might think that you're seeing a high resolution image, but actually it's quite blurred. The resolution is very anisotropic. Um, that's just a part of the nature of how the high one uh, makes its measurements. It's just a much longer exposure than core two. Uh, but that can be fixed in future instruments. That's sort of a lesson learned. Uh, but that change in the resolution really obscures a lot that's going on. There's another thing, which is over here, you can start to see in this radially scaled image, the star field coming up. And the star field starts to interfere. And so you have to ask yourself questions about, if I see a difference between what the plasma looks like over here and over here, is that really just because the noise floor is coming up and interfering with my measurement? Um, so uh, I already kind of spoiled. Uh, one possibility for why the character is different is turbulence. And there's a lot of evidence for turbulence in the solar wind. So I'm going to just show this slide to summarize um, probably 500 papers on turbulence in the solar wind that have been published by the in situ community. This is my favorite one from recent years, um, just showing that the temperature speed relationship of the solar wind really evolved. So these are scatter plots of speed versus temperature uh, taken in three different altitude ranges from the sun, a third of an AU, one AU, and four AU. And you can see that this really evolves a lot over time. So the, the wind is undergoing processing. Uh, and it's becoming more, adi the, the fluctuations are becoming more adiabatic as you move out. Um, and that's, that's a really compelling uh, statement that the solar wind is, in fact, acting like a turbulent fluid. It's not just propagating straight out from the sun. This, this in a nutshell, could be why uh, it works so horribly if you try to trace solar wind from the Earth back to the sun. It's rare to, to get within 10 degrees of, of latitude and longitude of where the real connection point is. And, and this is part of why, because the, the wind is actually being processed as it comes out. Um, recently, we were able to corroborate that story uh, in a new way just by studying uh, the, the Anki comet tail. Now, comet tails were used as evidence that there's a fast solar wind as far back as, as the 50s. Uh, Bierman did a lot of work. 
Um, Bierman did not have access to Pi-1 data and didn't have access to digital processing. So uh, we were able to process these images and produce images of the Anki ion tail that were longer than any other tracked comet tail in history. And that was pretty cool. So this is being tracked across about um, seven degrees of sky uh, with enough clarity that we can track individual features through the star field. And you can see this is really, a, this is two different levels of processing. So the top is best for the comet head here. The bottom really is best for the, the end of the tail, but it kills the comet head along with the stars. So I like to show both. Uh, but this is really evocative of like cigarette smoke rising up, uh, or, or if you prefer a, a snuffed candle sm uh, smoke plume coming up. So this is, this is uh, reminiscent of turbulence, and we went after uh, trying to study it. Now, other groups have studied comet tails like this. Uh, Enki's tail is very unusual. It's so unusual, we thought this was some kind of weird dust tail. Uh, Enki is uh, an inner solar system comet. It is an, uh, a very strange comet, but it's been in the inner solar system for a long time. So almost all the light elements are gone. Uh, the ionization tail here mostly has heavier ions, and so it doesn't look as feathery as you're used to, uh, just because the ions don't diffuse as fast along the magnetic field. Uh, Nuruddin Rauafi has, has published a parallel paper to this one uh, in which he talks about that. And uh, it's just it's fascinating if you're into cometology. But for us, it's just that thing that happened to be in the solar wind. So, um, a couple of years ago, uh, an RU student, one of Marty's students, uh, David Rice, came and helped me track uh, several hundred features uh, coming off this comet. And uh, we were able to see how they were picked up and how they moved around in the solar wind. So here's uh, just a view of, of what the, the geometry was during this observation. Here's Comet Enki. Um, it's going away from the sun as it goes toward the sun in the image plane. So that's counterintuitive. Here's the, the uh, viewpoint, and here's the sun. And you can see we're looking at a region that's sort of between uh, 0.35 and 0.4 AU from the sun uh, is being probed by the comet. So we looked at pairwise separation of features that came out of the comet, and we found this really interesting plot that I could probably spend an hour talking about. Uh, this is log time in kiloseconds, so divide by three and you get hours. Uh, this is Logarithm, logarithm of the mean pairwise separation of features that were initially close. So we're measuring how features separate. So on this plot, if everything were moving out in a Newtonian way, the average separation distance would increase linearly. So the, the squared separation distance, the R squared, would increase quadratically. Uh, in fact, it doesn't. It increases linearly. And that's characteristic of a random walk. Ballistic, excuse me, yes. I mean, I guess Newtonian physics really works. Yeah. <laughs> so if they were moving out ballistically. So here they're moving apart in a way that's characteristic of a random walk. And then we get a sub diffusive uh, or sub random uh, distribution in the far field. Um, that's really amazing. Uh, it shows that we have semi confinement at a large distance, which is characteristic of, of eddy flow. So we've identified an eddy scale in the solar wind. And to us, this is small scale. For, for imaging, this is small scale stuff. But for the turbulence guys, this is really large scale. This is right at what they call the energy bearing range in the beginning of the turbulent cascade at large scales. Um, if we look at the, yeah, there we go. The, I, I have to show the pickup time. So we, we measured how fast the tail was being picked up by the solar wind. These two points probably don't mean very much, but all of these points basically allow us to use the, the comet tail features as test particles in the solar wind because they've, they've been fully picked up. Uh, so if you look at the velocities, um, the relative velocities on average, again, this is v squared, not r squared, uh, they start out slow and they pick up to about um, a delta V of, of uh, 150 kilometers a second, uh, maybe a little more. Um, as a randomized relative velocity from features that left the same comet at different times. So they have been relatively accelerated to a pretty high fraction of the solar wind speed. Uh, it turns out this solves a problem that I didn't know existed, which is the solar wind heating problem. Just like the corona has a heating problem, so does the solar wind. The solar wind near the Earth has an electron temperature on the order of 100,000 degrees. 
If you adiabatically expand from the top of the corona, you expect more like 10,000. So where's the heat coming from? Well, the most obvious answer is a turbulent cascade of which we're seeing the, top, the high, the, the large scales. Uh, Bob Lehman has a recent paper about how the small, well, not that recent anymore, a classic paper, on how the small scales might work in the dissipative range at the other end of that cascade. Um, at this point, if we had better image quality uh, and more samples of Enki, we could probably start div digging into the actual uh, inertial range of that cascade. That's, that's pretty exciting stuff. But the conclusion of that is that the, yeah, yeah go ahead. So that's a good question. These velocities are very uncertain compared to the R squared distribution. And that's just inherent because you're, you're making a differential measurement between two positions, right? And so you have, you, you're subtracting two relatively big numbers to get a small one. Um, and so th this is in term determined entirely by the noise in our tracking. We, um, in fact, I should have said these error bars come from a one pixel offset. If we just assumed we were off by one pixel in the location of the feature, then, then that's the error. Thanks. Uh, it could be optimistic, but we actually, um, I tracked the full feature set and David Rice tracked the full feature set independently, and then we compared our two data sets. And we found, what we found was, aside from a few outliers where one of us attracts something and the other one hadn't, or where uh, we had confusion as to which of two features corresponded to one in a prior frame, uh, there were a couple of outliers like that. But beyond that, we were surprisingly close. We were, uh, our RMS was much better than a pixel. It was about a third of a pixel. So, um, there are line of sight effects, and so um, this is these separation distances include uh, the assumption that the 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 motion is isotropic in space. So there's a three halves effect that um, we're assuming that they're moving in the direction of the line of sight, sort of comparably to how they're moving in the plane. That's a good question. Uh, so. The conclusion of this was that, um, yes, there's enough energy, but also um, the mixing time is about a, a 30th of the transit time to Earth based on this relative speed and that scale size. So we concluded that on scales uh, shorter than about 90 minutes, the solar wind is almost fully mixed. And this turbulence follows log normal distributions and feature sizes, so you expect outliers where little patches are not well mixed or little other patches are very well mixed. Um, I'm going to keep moving on because we have more topics to cover. Um, but he, it's important to remember that turbulence isn't really the whole story. Um, Nikki Vial and uh, Angelos Verlitas and several others have, have done a lot of work recently on what we might call puffs. These are things that are similar to Shealy blobs, um, but they're not in streamers specifically. They're almost everywhere. And they come out and they can be seen entering the solar wind and propagating out. And these are identified, uh, let's see, we can identify them in the corona. This is just, uh, this is a radialized view of the core two corona during a deep field exposure campaign. Uh, and down here is uh, an edge enhanced version of the same movie. You can see that there are features moving out all over the place. Now, just from this movie, this is more evocative than anything else because you can uh, argue with me that, yeah, maybe these are edges that you're seeing that's ringing from your enhancement. Um, and that could be the case. I'm not going to defend it here just because this isn't the main topic of the talk. This is more to, to show you that there are fluctuations in the brightness at all azimuths, and they're propagating out, and many of them are, in fact, these blobs, even if not every single one is. Uh, so these are the puffs, uh, two images with high one um, from Vial et al. 2010. And uh, in 2015, she and uh, Vorlitis had a look at uh, uh, identifying them in situ, mainly by their, their time signatures. Uh, really neat work, but this is showing that at least some solar variability is not just from the turbulence. There's also variability in the sun itself. Distinguishing those two effects, or maybe seeing if the variability at the sun is seeding turbulence in some way, uh, is, is something that's very much an open question. 
So I'm going to move on to where does the corona stop. Here I've talked sort of back and forth across the outer edge and, and shown you what the solar wind looks like. Where does it end? And there are a lot of places where we're as graduate students or as postdocs taught to treat the corona as, as uh, stopping. Uh, if we like to look at UV images of the sun, we say it's about 1.3 solar radii. That's because uh, it's very hard to see UV emission lines beyond that. Uh, Proba 2 swap has changed that and pushed it out a little bit. Two and a half solar radii is for people who like potential field source surface models, right? That's where we put the source surface. Uh, there's in here, there's an alphane surface, which is where the wind flow exceeds, the flow speed exceeds the alphane speed. And that's the location where uh, the plasma becomes causally disconnected from the corona, at least for normal dynamics. Uh, and then farther out, we have uh, at 4 to 5 AU is where many in situ people place uh, the edge of the corona, or at least where magnetic field becomes open. And that's because they can actually trace superthermal ions that are zipping along the magnetic field line. They're steered by the field, uh, even though they're not part of the plasma physics of the field. Uh, and they leak out in about 4 to 5 AU. So when a field line loops around this long, they just say it's open because they can't see the return stream of those superthermal electrons. Uh, and then, of course, people who work on Voyager, of whom um, there have been many other than Ed Stone over the years, uh, like to place the, the, the edge at the heliopause, right, where, where the, the flow actually ends. Uh, but I think the natural boundary is the alphane surface, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, the alphane surface is kind of an event horizon. Uh, things that happen in the plasma inside the alphane surface uh, can affect the rest of the corona through MHD. Um, but those disturbances propagate at the speed of fast alphane waves. Uh, so this is a simulation that Marco Velli did that sort of shows how uh, outbound and how inbound disturbances in a 1D plasma propagate. And he's got an alphane point right around here at about 12 or 13 solar radii in this simulation. So if you launch a density disturbance from that place, if it's a little high, even though it's an inbound wave, it'll get ducted outward by the flow. Okay, so anything in this part of his simulation can't affect the bottom of the simulation. Anything inside here can. So that's sort of a natural place to say the material has separated from the corona. Anything that happens down on the bottom of the screen can, in principle, rearrange the entire corona, right? It can change the, uh, the topology and the equilibrium position of the entire corona. Anything out here is gone. Uh, this has consequences. Uh, one notable one that I think is under, it's under, uh, it, uh, it's not given enough attention, is that uh, the flux that crosses the alphane surface is semi-confined. There's only one way to add flux, open flux to the sun, if you define it as alphane open crossing that surface, and that is by emerging omega-shaped loops through it. So we see things like CMEs go out, they have uh, legs that are still connected to the sun, that produces new open magnetic field. And people like Nathan Schwadron have done work showing that if all of that newly open flux were allowed to stay open, uh, the IMF would double in a matter of months. But it doesn't. We don't live in an infinite IMF. Well, the only way to close magnetic field is by emerging U-loops through that surface. And the reason is you can't retract anything through the surface. You would have to retract faster than the alphane speed and you get a shock. We don't see inbound shocks there most of the time. So nearly all of the flux that opens from CMEs and other ejecta has to be closed by U-loops. This is a poorly studied phenomenon. But think about that. We have an equilibrium. We don't live in an infinite magnetic field in the IMF. Therefore, there's a process that opens flux. From a conservation law, we know that this other process has to happen. We all look at CMEs. Why isn't anybody looking at U-loops? And this is, this, is, this is a major hole in what our community is doing. People have. People have. Um, I have a paper on them. Uh, McComas has some. Yep, yep. Uh, but again, these, the, the amount of attention these have gotten is pretty underwhelming, right? Um, so they have to be there. Um, 
We know the alphane surface is most likely quite complex and variable. Cohen, just last year, started uh, tracking the alphane surface in his MHD simulations. And there's some beautiful pictures in this, this 15 paper uh, showing how it evolves in different, uh, different magnetic topologies. But again, we don't have a direct way of measuring the alphane surface, aside from going there or more sensitive imaging measurements. Uh, so this is really an area that the theorists have entirely too much free reign at the moment. Um, a couple of years ago, I went looking for the alphane surface by looking for inbound features in the outer corona. Uh, I used a bunch of uh, core two images, uh, roped in Dave McComas to, to make sure that we were honest. Uh, if we radialize that, we, you get something like this. You can see the two streamer belts at about 90 degrees and about 270. Here's the coronal hole going out. Again, you can see little fluctuations. This is not the deep field exposure, so it's hard to see those little fluctuations moving out here, but they're there. Um, the problem with finding inbound motions is they're overwhelmed by the outbound flow. The optical flow, that is to say the apparent motion of the plasma, is out, and it's so overwhelmingly out, it's hard for your eye to see things going in. So we use this FOIA analysis to try and isolate inbound features. The idea is you take a movie that's fundamentally a stack of images, so I have radius running this way, azimuth running into the page, and time running up for a 3D data cube. You Fourier transform that, and now you have wave number and frequency. And one side effect of the Fourier transform is that things moving at a particular speed end up in a particular part of that plane. Uh, we all learned about that in our junior high course on MHD waves um, with our omega k diagrams, right, or k omega diagrams, where you, you place the wave at a particular place and the, uh, the, the slope of the line tells you the phase speed and the position of the, of the point tells you the group speed. Uh, so we can find phase speeds, which is the same as optical flow. So we can isolate those, we do that. And uh, if we isolate these two quadrants, we get a Gazauta movie. And if we isolate these two, we get a Gazinta movie. Uh, so uh, the reason we keep just a part of this quadrant is we want to keep a range of speeds that sort of brackets where we think the solar wind might be. Uh, so when we do that, we get this. Here's the Gazauta movie on the top. Here's the Gazinta movie on the bottom. Uh, all this rain that you're seeing here is, is uh, photon noise, because photon noise is white noise. It moves in all directions all at once. So half of it ends up up here, half of it ends up down here. But look at these large scale features. Right? Out here, you've got stuff moving out. There's a CME going out and other things moving out in the streamer belts. But you also have things moving in down here. Those are real. That is the corona telling itself where to go after the CME leaves. This is how the corona tells itself what to be, is by propagating MHD fast and slow waves. Um, and, and you can actually see them in these filtered movies. That's kind of neat. So to go any further, we have to turn the movie sideways. So now time is running left to right. And um, the time axis, the, the motion, is azimuth. So we're just scanning around the sun in azimuth. And unfortunately, I've reversed the Gazinta and Gazauta directions. Gazauta is on the bottom. So you can see sloping lines that are diagonal up and to the right. That's things that are moving away from the sun. Okay, And up here, in the top frame, you can see things that are sloping down down to the right, those are things that are moving toward the sun. Uh, so let's look at a particular plane of that. This is the, the eastern streamer belt. And there is a bunch of stuff we can see here. These are stars. They're, they're localized. They're moving in. We're on the eastern side of the sun. Um, I, I didn't put that slide in, but if you look at 90 degrees azimuth, you can see stars moving out and not in because you're on the other side. Uh, this is a CME. That CME that I pointed out as it went by so fast was moving out through the movie, and this is it. This is what it looks like in this sideways cut. Okay, um, It has a return signal. In fact, it has two of them. Here's a fast mode return signal that's moving at about the fast mode speed, um, order of several hundred kilometers a second. Here's a slow mode return signal. It's moving about 100 kilometers a second. That's really cool. You can sort of pick out in these, in these planes different kinds of MHD modes that are moving around the corona. Here's a large and slower moving CME from the movie. Whoop. Yeah, and it, it has a return signal as well, but it's fainter. These things here seem to come from it. Uh, if we look in the, in the coronal hole, sorry, in the, yeah, in the coronal hole, right over the southern pole, uh, 
we don't see CMEs and things, which sort of confuse us uh, because they're big and, and they draw the eye. Instead, we see this stuff that looks a lot like noise, but it turns out it's not noise. This is our speed filter profile. It looks like a bow tie. Um, so that's the point spread function of this filter profile looks like a bow tie on here. So things like this that sort of open up, you can see this little bright feature here. That's probably the response of the filter to a point source. Something flashed on for a minute or there was a, a, a star that didn't get filtered out or something. And so we see the, the profile propagating away. So and it's also going at the cutoff speed. So that's, that's not so good. But if you look over here, look between these two green lines, you'll see three long, narrow little features. Okay? Those are characteristic of real things. They're not expanding like the point spread function of the filter. And they're all over. I've just highlighted one particular one. But anywhere you look, you'll see these long, narrow features. Those are real. And the reason it looks like noise is we're just not used to looking at this kind of plot. So we can do a speed spectrum analysis of these regions and find out how the characteristic speed of those features varies with height. When we do that, we get a plot like this in the lower right here. Um, this is inbound speed of features between 20 and 100 kilometers a second. This is altitude. Down here, the speed seems to be below the cutoff frequency of the filter, so we just get rid of it. Up here, things get noise limited, so I don't really believe it, um, though some people think they see a ridge that does this which is sort of what you'd expect. But in the main part of the image, we see that things are accelerating. That is to say, or decelerating, I guess. Inbound features at high altitude are moving in fast. Inbound features at low altitude are moving in slow. This is an enigma. It doesn't match what you see from these simulations at all. Right Out here, you expect that features that are just inside the alphane surface will be moving in slowly. And as you get farther away from the alphane surface, they'll move in faster and faster. So you expect this to have the opposite slope. Uh, Tenerani et al., uh, th this last year, or I guess this last spring, uh, got out a paper showing that this actually fits what you expect from inbound jets from reconnection. Um, it's still a diagnostic of the alphane surface, even though they're not pure waves. But with more sensitivity, maybe we could pick out the wave field itself. Maybe this is the wave field. I don't know. It's, I, I marked it noise limited because I'm not willing to hang my hat on it yet. So um, there's another important boundary that we want to look at other than the alphane surface, which is the beta equals 1 surface. Remember, we talked at the beginning about beta shrinks. And therefore, uh, sooner or later, the flow has to start acting more hydrodynamic and less <coughs> magnetic. Well, so let's look at that. This is the deepest field sequence ever made by core 2. Um, and we can look for things in it. Um, we, the main thing I want to show you here is that with the deep field measurement, the main thing that sticks out is just how radially structured the corona is. Right when you, when you expose longer, the photon noise is less. And so therefore, you can see right down to the optical resolution of the instrument. And you can see that the corona is radially structured at very fine scales for this instrument all the way out. And it really is radial. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff coming out right, on individual magnetic field lines. And then there are the occasional things where you get a CME that just punches through the whole thing. But by and large, the wind flow is really structured well by the magnetic field. Why doesn't it look like that? Right? This is, this is a, a high Reynolds number jet shooting out into um, uh, air. And what you're seeing is eddies and things forming. But in particular, you're seeing that the jet itself spreads out with a characteristic angle. Why aren't those striae in the corona spreading out? Well, right here, you can see each one of these is just sort of going out radially. It's not spreading out with some larger super radial angle. Um, of course, you all remember, it's because the main way that those eddies form is the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. And that's suppressed by the magnetic field. So if here on the left, or sorry, let's look on the, yeah, on the left. We got um, two magnetic domains separated by some field lines. If the magnetic domains start to bend, the magnetic curvature force in a low beta plasma is stronger than the Bernoulli force from the flow. And so it'll stabilize that perturbation. It'll just, it'll move it back to the, the, the restoring force is larger than the, the Bernoulli force, and so it'll stabilize. But in high beta, you expect that 
um, the Bernoulli force is going to overwhelm the magnetic curvature force. And so you expect small perturbations to grow. And that's how you get turbulence. So we might expect that just above the beta equals 1 surface, we ought to see turbulence forming. And we know that there's turbulence in the wind, so there it is. Uh, this is Lasco C3 moving out. Again, um, this is basically just highlighting the same point. To the limits of that instrument, um, things really are confined right, to, right out to 30 solar radii. Uh, in high one, again, you see this transition that we talked about at the beginning. Um, scaling this, like the apparent distance from the sun cubed, brings up the star field. And you can see the star field really overwhelms. So now we're into the meat here. I'm going to talk about imaging the outer corona or the outer, the top of the corona, and how we can be sure that we're seeing what we're seeing. So when we remove the star field through median filtering, we get something like this. Now this, this image sequence has been heavily processed. It's been median filtered on a variable scale. So in here where the noise is lower, we used a narrower um, median filter, and out here we used a large neighborhood median filter. And also, I've done some temporal averaging um, but in order to avoid motion blur, I've done temporal averaging in the moving frame. And you can see that here. This is Venus coming through. There's three images of Venus. That's because Venus doesn't move like the solar wind does. And so it appears in three places from the three frames that have been averaged together. Uh, so out down here, you see the, the striated corona. Out here, you see what we're calling the flocculated appearance. Um, it looks like the side of a sheep. Uh, fleece or like a uh, flocculated solution, like if, you're, if any of you is a home brewer, you will have seen a flocculated wort and that sort of matches the, the texture of the, of the wind out here. So if we look at that in radial coordinates, so it's a little easier to see, um, these are conformal radial coordinates. Again, that's a log scale on the left. So if something looks a certain shape here, that's the shape it would be on the sky, but the scale changes across the, the image. Uh, you can see the streamer belts here, you can see a CME going out, and you can see that these striae visibly fade here. And uh, in the paper on this, we, we went to a great deal of length to eliminate all the different things that the objections various people had raised to calling that the end of the, of the, the streamer, or yeah, end of the striae or the streamers. Whoops. Let's go back here. This is supposed to be a movie. There we go. This is an unsharp masked movie, and in the unsharp masked version, you can really see this is evocative of things starting to break up. Okay, but again, you don't want to trust an unsharp master movie without being very careful. So we'll go through and do some analysis. Does our R cubed scaling work? Does the wind actually get fainter like R cubed, R to the minus 3? Um, or are things fading out because we're, we're scaling not aggressively enough or too aggressively? Well, here's a mini CME. We can follow it out through the movie. And you can see that its apparent brightness in the scaled movie, this R cubed brightness scaled, um, funny scale brightness, uh, the apparent brightness stays the same. Likewise, if we look at the small faint puff of plasma, it stays at about the same brightness. These units here are solar radiance times 10 to the minus 11 times degree cubed. So if, if something has a value of 1, that means that 1 degree away from the sun, it'll have a brightness of 10 to the minus 11 solar brightnesses. Uh, and 10, it would be 10 to the minus 1, 2, 3, 14. Uh, okay, if we track striae, well, here's a stria, and I'm calling any, anything is just a radial line a stria. It's a term of observation, and we started using that just to avoid any kind of theoretical overlay. So what you can see here is the stria stays about the same brightness. Okay, if you look over here, you'll see something strange happen, which is that a mustache just appears. It fades in. This is the flocculation. This is why the texture changes. The striae fade with altitude, okay, and these flocules, or flocculi, uh, fade in. Well, what's going on there? It turns out the fading striae um, really are fading. We tried a number of things. Uh, are, they, are they moving out of the region of angles that we can see? Um, you would see some striae fade in with altitude if that were the case. That doesn't happen. Uh, we, we tried a bunch of things I'm not going to go into in detail uh, unless someone asks about it. Uh, and we found that, yes, they really are fading. Uh, furthermore, especially here, this, this is a twofer here, this image sequence, you can see a striae here. This is at 
five degrees from the sun, so 20 solar radii, it's very clear. Um, by the time you get out to 12 degrees from the sun, so 48 solar radii, uh, it's pretty faint. And it's essentially gone um, by the time you get out to 60 or 80. So um, there, there's the fading quantified. And at the same time, you can see these, these flocculi fading in. Here's one right here. It just appears. Um, as with everything, what's going on is you, you can't resolve everything that's happening. So with the fit, go ahead. So, that's a really good question. Uh, how do you get? How do you account for the Parker spiral? We did not, and the Parker spiral is essentially negligible out to about a third of a an AU. Well, you, you started talking about many degrees. So how far are we going? Uh, we're going out to twenty twenty apparent degrees from the sun. Which is what? Which is point four AU. Uh, point three to point four, depending on where on the line of sight you are. Yeah. So yeah. That's a really good it's point. An interesting field of view that you have as a fisheye. Yeah. I don't know how you. That's one reason why it's negligible is we're looking near the equator, and so it's a line of sight effect, right? It, almost all of the Parker spiral ends up being projected into the line of sight, uh, but we should talk about this at more length after. Uh, so mass quote conservation is being violated, not really, but the, the mass in this feature is going down. Um, if we scale, whoops, if we scale the turbulence is measured at 1 AU in situ down to this altitude range, um, we expect that the turbulence scale is, is about four times smaller than we can resolve. Uh, however, again, remember there are outliers. Turbulence doesn't scale nicely. It has this n log n distribution, uh, says a log normal distribution. So you expect outliers. And so we might expect to see some of the largest eddies here. A closer look shows that there are lateral motions, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, some people have said it's due to noise effects, so I want to address that. Um, if we take, uh, here's a picture of a stria near the middle of the field view, close to the sun. Uh, and here it is at the outer edge where it's faded quite a bit in the scale brightness. Uh, if we smooth it vertically or horizontally, we can see the stria appear in the smooth version. We can beat down the noise floor and actually bring the stria out. So it's still present. It hasn't uh, disappeared into the noise and we've lost it. Um, they're still there, they're just fading. Uh, we use vertical and horizontal to show that we're not just dragging out signal from lower altitude, right? The, the anisotropy and the fact that you see the same feature in both kinds of smoothing shows you that, um, that it's, it's a real feature you're bringing out. You're not, you're not just introducing an artifact. Here's the, uh, I talked about um, the striae seem to be moving consistently with turbulent buffeting. Uh, this is the center of a particular piece of a striae traced in the co-moving frame. So each of these error bars is in a different place in, in the movie. It's a different uh, location and a different time. We followed a particular bolus of plasma as it moves out. You can see it doesn't move radially. It moves laterally a little bit. These are error bars for placement of the, of the feature in any one frame. And you can see that the motion is within the error bars of any one frame, but there's this coherent structure to it that is statistically significant. So it's sort of a faint detection of, of something that could be real. We see it with every, basically every stria we've tracked. We, we see motions on this side. Those are consistent with the onset of vortex shedding or turbulent buffering just below the resolution limit. Um, of course, uh, it's best to, to take that with a little salt because it's, it's so close to the, the air bars. Uh, growing flocculi. Well, here's some flocculi fading in. Um, they're consistent with just what we know about the, the variation in wind speed. 10% variation or 20% variation in wind speed is enough to cause pileup of this size. Okay, but there's more going on because these flocculi are wider than the striae. So if a stria fades and a flocule forms, uh, this, if, if everything were magnetically confined, the flocule ought to be about the same size as the stria. But it's not. They're much wider. And so this is indicating there's some kind of cross-field activity going on. This is, this is collective motion that's larger than the original flux tubes. 
So that, again, is consistent with things starting to shed vort vortices and do lateral mixing. Uh, here's a growing flocule, just another close-up movie. You can see it, it forming as we go out. So we're tracing the wind flow, and right here in the middle of the movie, you can see this little mustache sort of fade in over the course of the, of the, the transit. All right, so um, getting close to the end here, uh, and I'm also close to the, the end of the section. So uh, we actually went back and looked with structure functions at the overall texture. Now, structure functions are a little bit unusual for most of us, but they are a way to measure how an image or really any distribution of data points varies without respect to the particular value at any one point. So uh, the structure function here is the average di uh, difference squared between a particular point and its neighbors versus position of that neighbor relative to the initial point. Okay, And the reason that's useful is you can average that quantity over the whole image. So you can get an overall average character of how structured the distribution is without regard to the particular shape of, the, of that distribution. You know, if you see a bunch of eddies, they'll all average out. But you can tell if something's isotropic or anisotropic and how rapidly it varies. And that's a very useful diagnostic for looking at things like why textures change. So here you can see close to the sun, the, the image structure function is highly anisotropic. And that's reflecting the fact that we're looking mainly at striae, right? We're looking at radial structure. And so vertically, things don't change very much. Horizontally, they change very quickly. Okay, by the time we get out to 20 degrees, it's almost isotropic. Okay, and this is a fundamental change. It's well below the noise floor, um, and the shape of the structure function is not characteristic of noise in the images. And I, I don't want to go into that because I think I'm over time, and I'm sorry about that. But I'll answer it in questions later if people want to talk about it. Uh, these are cuts through the structure function. And if you have sharp eyes, you'll see that these are dB degrees here. And what, what the heck is a dB degree? We're looking at a log scale. So offsets in those movies correspond to decibels in, in radius from the sun. So one decibel is about a factor of 1.25. So if we went one decibel, it would be 25% farther from the sun. Um, this goes from minus 0 0.8 to 0 0.8, so this is about a 20% variation in distance from the sun. Uh, so here's some more cuts. You can see that the horizontal cut, that's the purple line here, softens in azimuth with altitude. That is to say things are spreading out. They're becoming less structured around the sun as we go out. Uh, meanwhile, the vertical cuts are getting harder as we go in. They're getting more structured in the vertical direction. Well, that's actually a reflection of the logarithmic scale. And we can check that. Uh, so. We have to convert angle to solar distance. Uh, I'm just going to throw these slides up to show that we've, we've thought about it. Um, it's not just straight trig trigonometry. You have to really think about what it means in the context of a broad line of sight and the fact that perspective affects mixed scales. The bottom line is down here, um, close to the sun, our scales are mixed by about 20%, and far from the sun, they're mixed by almost a factor of two. But because those structure functions have linear sidewalls, this all kind of comes out in the wash. That is to say, I wouldn't hang my hat on a particular shape to those sidewalls of the structure functions uh, because of this mixing of scales. But because they happen to be linear, uh, the slope of that line is actually pretty good. Despite the mixing, it all, it all comes out in the wash. So when we convert from angular coordinates to actual gigameters, remember gigameter is a million kilometers, uh, what we see is that the radial structure, that's the, the dashed green lines here, stays about constant. So the plasma is not becoming more structured in the radial direction. It's only becoming less structured in the azimuthal direction relative to radial smooth expansion. Uh, and this plot just shows the, the width of a, a constant height cut through the structure function. And you can see that it, just, it doesn't change very much. Uh, so what did we just see? We've observed the transition from, from coronal to solar wind dynamics. The young solar wind is, is different, and we've seen that throughout this talk. Uh, it's, it looks different from the corona. Just at a glance, you can identify that it's not a piece of the corona. 
Um, and that's, we've, we've identified why that texture changes. These radial striae, the flux tubes, the streamer tops, the everything else coming from the corona, uh, fade out in the image plane. And at the same time, we see this, this transverse or radial, however you want to call it, structure, these little mustaches that, that are growing all over the place. And they fade in with this instrument. Uh, and the combination of those two things sort of points very strongly to large-scale hydrodynamic turbulence that's just not quite resolved. Right? Um, we can't have a uniform flow that produces striae that fade in the way they do. They have to be losing mass laterally. Uh, we can't explain the collective behavior of the striae through statistical means or anything else. They have to be a collective local phenomenon that's growing, and it's got the wrong scale to be associated with the magnetic field. So this is, uh, again, a, a symptom of cross field mixing the onset of turbulence. Uh, and the image structure function isotropizes, which is what you expect from hydrodynamic flow. Uh, so somewhere in here is where turbulence picks up. Now, there may be anisotropic turbulence in the corona. People like Steve Cranmer talk about that all the time. What I'm talking about now is your garden variety hydrodynamic turbulence, where the magnetic field doesn't play a major role. So what's needed next? Well. I've talked a lot about how the corona and the solar wind are connected to each other. And these two fields of, of understanding the heliosphere, the solar wind, and understanding the corona are deeply related. Um, and to understand this suite of questions, we really need to treat them as a uniform field. But over the last five decades, the fields studying each of those parts of the overall system have specialized. Right? The best way to study the solar wind up till now has been through in situ measurement. The best way to study the sun has been through remote sensing, because we can't go there. Um, but we really need to break the political and, and collegial divide that's grown up as a consequence of these two different technologies. Um, now, that's starting to happen just because the technologies have gotten good enough that we can cross them with directly with measurements. We now have solar probe going into the corona to do in situ coronal physics, right? These images demonstrate that we can now do large scale solar wind physics and measure it with imaging. And so uh, in some way, those domains really are intersecting now in a way that they weren't back when we were talking about the sun earth connection and trying to, to unify the fields in the 90s. Um, so maybe uh, we'll start to really get some some good progress on these questions up above that really require uh, mixing between the fields. Um, as far as what to do in situ, well, I think Solar Probe Plus is, is doing a great job of you know, sampling the corona. Uh, Solar Orbiter is going to bring us new perspectives and correlative work between in situ and remote sensing from the new perspectives. We also need better solar wind imaging. Um, neat though these images are, um, there's still a lot more we could do if we could just get a little bit better. Um, fortunately, these kinds of images aren't that hard to make in terms of the hardware. Uh, it's the post-processing of existing sort of run-of-the-mill imaging hardware. Uh, so hopefully we can make some progress on that. Summing up, the alpha and beta equals one surface are both important to the transition. Uh, we talked about those and what, what my group anyway has done to, to look for them. Um, and the, the real meat of this talk is that we can now observe directly in the images this transition out of the corona into the solar wind. It's the top of the solar corona. That's a big deal. Um, that's maybe a step, I hope, toward unifying our fields. If we can just get the message not just to solar people, like all of us, but to in situ people as well, to people who study the solar wind. Uh, we can see the breakup of the structure. We can see. Uh, the variability seems to be due to a combination of solar and in-transit processes. And that sort of highlights that these two communities really have to come together to make process, progress. Um, like the coronal heating problem being due both to, well, the corona is heated both by waves and by reconnection, right? So people fought about that for years. And it turns out that both of those processes probably play a role. Um, likewise, uh, nobody's really uh, going to have the answer with, with just half the question or half the field. And then. Um, once again, a call to unity, a call for unity in, in the sciences. Um, thanks for the attention.
and we started a couple minutes late, so we do actually have some time for questions. We'll turn the lights on so everybody wakes up. So the, the largest reservoir of free energy in the solar wind is differences in outflow speed. And that's almost all, I believe, fed into a turbulent cascade uh, in this region that we're talking about. That's my prejudice, and I'll just put it out there. But it's a prejudice that's informed by looking at these data. Uh, Yes, yes. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit, which is um, to point out there are probably stellar wind heating problems, just as there is a solar wind heating problem, sure. right? And ongoing acceleration forces and things like that. Um, that turbulent energy reservoir is maybe a way to drive those things. And this isn't a new thought. Um, the only thing that's really new here is being able to see the transition from the energy bearing range into the inertial range. Right? There's been a tremendous amount of work done on the kinematics of how do you get energy out of the very smallest ranges, the dissipation range. Right? But, and this speaks more to how do you fill that cascade from the top. Yeah. Joe? So So we did not see any sign of an alphane surface out to 15 solar radii. Uh, but in the coronal hole where we looked most rigorously, uh, we were noise limited at about 13. Uh, and so with this new deep field uh, data set, hopefully we'll be able to push that right to 15. And then maybe we'll start looking at high one, which has a little more sensitivity. That was going to be my question. Any other questions? I'm sorry, the, the question Keep going, Joan. Sorry. <laughs> the, the loop, so when there's a CME, uh, you're going to expect that's going to be a reconnection site when you have a new loop going up and down. Do you, do you, have a, do you ever see, when you see the downflow, you think of the loop? Do you see a corresponding upflow? Can you actually say, do you guys think I'm near the reconnection site? Or? So we have done, uh, McComas and I and Tim Howard, uh, did a, a rudimentary survey uh, as part of our initial paper. Uh, and ever since then, that's about four years, five years ago now, uh, I guess it was four, it's four years ago. Ever since then, we've been trying to get funded to do a more systematic survey. And so far, we haven't been able to convince people to, to fund it. Um, but whether we do it or you do it, uh, I'd like to see it get done. So um, with the heliospheric imagers, we can pick out the U-loops because of their form much more easily than you can in the corona. And so w our method was to find them in high one or in high two, and then track them backwards to the corona. And there, they just look like a piece of a streamer uh, because they're, they're squished together so much. Uh, but in each one of them that we've identified, you can go back to the corona, you can see a reconnection event with a classic X point signature where something retracts and something goes out. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, are those features mostly due to, are you saying because of the speed variation with height and size, that it's mostly because the signals are due to reconnection? So, is that, is that what you yeah, so that, that curve is sloping the wrong direction, and it's curved the wrong direction, it turns out. Uh, and so, it, uh, Tenerani uh, and, and Belli uh, tried a number of different models for what could be producing that signature. And the one that fit the best was, uh, inbound omega loops from a, a reconnection high in the in the coronal hole, uh, where where the material was coming down and hitting the outbound material and slowing down, uh, and so an ensemble of events like that produces a curve of that shape. Uh, so that's that's the current best guess as to what that is. Will there be an attempt to uh, stretch that to a larger scale? 
Certainly. The, the, issue, the real issue with going to large scales with the in situ is, is that you, you have a single sample. Right, and you're, you can sample over a long direction in one direction by just by letting the wind go past you, right? But you don't really have anything in the other direction, so you have to make an assumption about how the distribution works. Uh, so I see joint studies between this kind of imaging work and in situ work as being critical to really understanding the, the Multiple cascade. Probes. Multiple probes would be great. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Craig again. Thanks thank you, everybody. And the colloquia will resume on January 4th.